Thank you for tuning in and listening to another sermon in the series of words that will make us wise. Words out of Proverbs. And it's my honor this morning to introduce a guest speaker, Tom Lamshed. He's the regional director of the AGC East. Now, for those of you who don't know the AGC, it's the Associated, um, Associated Gospel Churches in Canada, Grace Church belongs to the AGC, this association of churches. And we also fall into the eastern region. So Tam Lynch, uh, Tam, sorry, Tom, <laughs> Tom Lamshed had been for us also a very important resource because not only is he the director, before that he served a number of pastoral roles in different churches, leading, guiding, equipping leaders through transition, in leadership, in fact, he also did his doctorate, if I'm not wrong, in leadership. So with that, it is really my pleasure to introduce Tom this morning, but I'm also looking forward to hear what he is going to tell us out of Proverbs, to see how the Lord is also using him this morning to teach us something about wisdom. So with that, uh, Tom, I'll hand it over to you. May God bless you, and thank you. Brother. Oh, good to be at Grace again. I decided when I walked through the doors this morning something, I decided I like you. <laughs> you, you know, when you come a few times, you get to know names and faces, and, and you get to have those conversations which sort of uh, round out your life and fill you up. And so I just decided this morning, I like you. Thank you for having me come along again and enjoying uh, your company and just being here to, to share with you. I'm proud of this church. Uh, I'm really proud of this church. Uh, now, i biased because you're one of mine, right? But the truth is, I really am. The Lord is doing some great things, and I appreciate your resilience and your faith as you uh, serve Him so faithfully here. I, I see that on the calendar, I believe it's next week, that a different guy is preaching here. His name is Bill Allen. Um, now, I don't know if you know Bill or not, but if you've been around Grace for a long time, you know that he's been a member here for a bunch of years, one of your missionaries. He also happens to be my boss, okay? So I, I, I need you to do something for me. This is personal, okay? What I need you to do, at least some of you, and you know who you are, uh, you, I need you after he preaches to go up to Bill and say, Bill, that was a wonderful sermon, but the last guy last week was way better. Okay, that, and I'll be sure to do that, okay? Um, he'll maybe catch on to the, to the joke, and then we'll all get a good laugh, right? If he doesn't catch on to the joke, then I win anyways, right? So, um, so be sure to do that for dear old Bill, okay, for me. Uh, don't tell him I said so, okay? So, um, and I did listen in last week as well to uh, Pastor Ian Ardill, who started this series for us on the, the Proverbs. Um, uh, it was great to get an introduction once again to the book of Proverbs and to hear what, what wisdom is. If you missed that, you do need to start uh, there, okay? So listen in on there. Today I want to take us a next step, not just what wisdom is, but how to get it. And we're going to talk out of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, maybe a verse that you've memorized before. Now, I'm proud of Grace Church for digging into this series over the summertime, words that make you wise, because we really do live in an unwise era. It's a bold statement, I know. It's not that we're missing information. We have more information than ever. But we're not really living in a wise world. Um, Maybe you know, but the Oxford Dictionary adds words to the dictionary from time to time, usually annually. The 2016 International Word of the Year was post-truth. Now, if you know the English language and how it functions, you know that the word post means after, right? After truth. We live in a post-truth world. What that means by definition is that objective facts are not as influential as personal opinion. 
as personal beliefs. We live in a post-truth time, a time when we can talk about the fact that we have gone beyond truth to something different that operates, that functions in our world in a very functional way. We live in a post-truth era so that if we have different opinions, then I just cancel you. You've heard that language, right? If we don't agree, then apparently you're not woke. You've heard that. There is no such thing as debate anymore, right? It's all about my truth is all that matters. We live in a post-truth era, an unwise era, one that actually doesn't function around wisdom. It actually functions around things that are relative to me. Now, dear friends, it doesn't take a great brain, a great mind to understand that if truth is only relative to me, then there actually is no truth. We live in an unwise era. I'm reading a book called uh, The Wisdom Pyramid. So far, it's a good book to read, so I can't recommend the whole thing, but so far, in his introduction, Brett McCracken says this, our world has more and more information, but less and less wisdom. More data, less clarity. More pontificating, less pondering. More opinion, less research. More speaking, less listening. There is more, but we are all less. We need some words that make us wise. Because we're getting all kinds of information, but it's not adding up to wisdom and how to live. More and more information, less and less wisdom. Now, we get our information from multiple sources, but I think two are primary today. I think we get our, a lot of information from the 24-hour news feeds out there, right? You ever notice news has gone from every now and then to all day long? You can watch a news feed all day long. And what that means, I mean, there's not more and more newsworthy stuff to say. <laughs> it's just that they have to fill it up with stuff that either sounds newsworthy or is really full of opinion, post-truth. The other source of information we get a lot is uh, social media, right? Social media. The, 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 the bastion of, a, of personal opinion. Where, where, what you're reading about is all kinds of opinion, not a lot of research. All kinds of personal beliefs. All kinds of impossibly beautiful people telling us impossibly beautiful things about their impossibly beautiful life. This is where we're getting our information from. It, it seems in our world that everybody has a megaphone and no one has a filter. How do you live in an unwise world? Hmm? How do you live in an unwise world? Now, dear friends, I think this is where Proverbs comes to play. These are proverbial. These are beyond our wisdom. Isn't it great that God decided to include these snippets of truth that add wisdom that's beyond the inherent weakness of human wisdom? And I think Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, a very famous verse, one that you've heard before even this year. These, these verses are the, the things that remind us, is the verse that reminds us how to get that wisdom. Where is that going to come in a world that's post-truth? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He will make your paths straight. 
Okay, that's my way of saying Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. What's yours? Did, did anybody here ever memorize Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Put up your hand. Just wave it over here. Okay, a good bunch of you. All right. So here's what I want us to do. Out loud, let's all say it at the same time. Okay? Because there will be different versions that come out, and some of the versions will be all mixed up. And maybe even different language. And if you can say it in different language, bless us by doing that, okay? Because that would be cool to hear. Let's just say it out loud. If you know it, say it out loud. Here we go. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. If you haven't memorized that, you should go ahead and do that. Because it will live with you. Because it is how you get wisdom. Now, I'm going to compare what the scripture is saying there to three, actually to four stop signs, just as memory cues, okay? So whenever you're driving your car, you might remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and it'll come to mind as to how to get the wisdom that we need for living. So here's the first one. The first sign is to yield, okay? It's the yield sign. And it's from that phrase, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Okay, put up my yield sign on the screen there. There we go. Most of us know how to drive a vehicle. We've seen that. We, we had to test on that sign, right? What does that sign mean? What does the yield sign mean? Slow down. Yeah. Watch out. Think. Yeah, okay. It's just that. that. There's a bunch of sermons right there, right? And any one of those words, excellent. It, it basically, if you're having to yield, it means that somebody else has the priority, right? Somebody else on the road has the priority. You need to yield in to what's going on there. You yield to somebody else. Trust in the Lord. That's what, this is basically what this life is about is to yield to someone outside of yourself to give way to some to put your confidence in something else as a matter of fact that's what the word trust actually means the word trust actually in its original hebrew form back in the day of the writing of the proverbs that word trust actually meant to hide for refuge it would be used in the sense of when you're in the, the heat of the day and the sun was burning you and you would go to the cave to get out of there, you would go there for refuge from the sun, from the weather. Or in, the, in a battle where there was getting uh, heated in battle. And then you would go to that cave, to, you would trust in it. You would have a refuge in that. Because of that uh, mental image of what, trust was, then it became the, the, the word for confidence. It became the word to have confidence in something else. So you would have confidence in that cave. I'm going to that cave because I'm confident that there I have the protection. And that's exactly what this author is communicating to us. We trust in the Lord. What we do is we say, I have confidence in something else. Something not me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, of course, trust is a prominent topic in the Bible, right? You cannot have a whole lot of exposure to the Scripture without actually having a whole lot of exposure to this world, word called trust. And it means simply what I've just said. You actually place your confidence, and in this case, you place your confidence in God. You make that conscious choice that what I'm going to do is I'm going to rely on him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, a lot of people think of trust as just blindly believing something, right? If you trust something, you're just blindly believing it, even if there isn't any reasonable reason to believe in it. In fact, trust means that there can't be any reasons to believe in it. That's why you trust. And I, I want to submit to you that that's not actually a biblical understanding of what trust means. Actually, it just means not something that's purely illogical or purely emotional. That's really far away from the biblical understanding of truth. 
of trust, rather. Trust is a conscious choice. It's a calculated decision. It's a decision of the mind, also a decision of the heart, to say that I will count on God. I remember uh, friends of ours as we were very young in our own family days, having children and raising children. Kevin and Carolyn were friends and they were part of our little group at church and Kevin and Carolyn amongst the rest of us, they were not able to have children and multiple medical difficulties was not heading in a good direction for them and uh, so they weren't they weren't able to have children and that was a heartbreak for them as they watched all the rest of us do what sometimes happens in family life having children along the way and I remember uh, actually interviewing Kevin wanting him to give his testimony of what does it mean to live in that reality and he talked to the church and the group and he talked about what it meant to you know, live that, that reality. And he said something to me from which I've never really recovered. He said, whatever happens, we will accept God's outcome. Now my friend, that is trust, right? That is trust, that's not just blindly believing something. That is deciding to yield to God for whatever God would have. That is trust. You place your confidence in something that's outside of yourself. It doesn't always happen this way. God does not always work this way. But I will never also forget the day that I dedicated their little baby girl whom they named Faith. See, this is, this is wisdom. Wisdom is placing your confidence in God. That is God's solution to the realities of life. You trust outside of yourself. Now, the other side of that coin is the next phrase that's in Proverbs 3, okay? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, yield. Lean not on your own understanding. Now that would equate to the stop sign, right? Whereas, whereas trusting in the Lord is yielding, then leaning not would be stopping. Stopping the confidence that I have in myself. Friends, human wisdom is inherently weak. Okay, human wisdom is inherently weak. I'm not a cynic. I'm not suggesting that it's all bad, okay? That's not the point here. It's not that we don't have understanding. As a matter of fact, the scripture actually says you have understanding, but that's not the point. Human wisdom is inherently weak because it can only decide on that which has been or that which is. We do not know the future. We do not know what is yet to come. And most of our lives, the decisions of our lives, have to do with that which is to come. How are we going to live out there? What's going to happen tomorrow? What should I do today that allows me to live tomorrow? Most of our lives is lived with the anticipation of whatever is coming down the pike. But we don't live there. We do not know. This is why human wisdom is inherently weak, because it doesn't have a whole picture. And then there is God, the God that we call eternal. And if God is eternal, what that means is that he lives outside of space and time. He's beyond the space-time continuum. He's already in the future. The future is present to God. He understands All that was, is, and will be. And because of that, his wisdom is inherently perfect. He has what we don't have. He has the strength of wisdom that can take in all eventualities of life. 
It's not that our wisdom is all bad. It just isn't the whole picture. There is a sense in which our wisdom is foolishness to God. <laughs> it's not that it's foolish. It's just that our wisdom just is the very scraping, the very bottom of the bucket of all that God knows and all that God is and all that God decides. So dear friends, does not it make sense then to lean not on your own understanding? Does it not make sense then to yield in, to trust God whose wisdom is inherently strong, perfect, and is whole. Now, does that mean that we don't make plans? Well, that would be dumb, right? It would be dumb not to make plans. It would be dumb not to think through how do we operate in life. It would be dumb for us actually not to, be, to ponder rather than pontificate, right? To filter rather than to megaphone, right? It would be dumb, to do that. The, the scripture actually says we actually have understanding. So it's not a matter of not planning. But life is difficult. You think some things just don't add up. From a human perspective, sometimes God doesn't even make sense. But our wisdom is really just the bottom of the bucket of what God has. We need to stop leaning on our, understand, our own understanding. Speedboat driver was uh, speeding along at, at ridiculous speeds that they go. And as he turned a corner, caught the wave in the wrong way, and the, the, the nose of the, the speedboat hit the wind, and it just shot the thing up like a rocket, way up in the air. But in do so doing, it also drove the driver deep, deep, deep down into the water. So deep that he did not know in which direction was the surface. Now, friends, it's useless to swim when you don't know where the surface is. So all he needed to do was to wait calmly and then allow that life jacket to do what that life jacket does. Start dragging him in the direction that he should go. My friends, this is our God. Sometimes in life, many times in life, we're so driven so deep, we don't even know where the surface is. We don't even know which direction to swim. And then we wait on God. We stop leaning on our understanding. We stop thrashing around swimming in directions in which we don't even know. And we wait for God to start taking us in the direction that he knows we need to go. If we were to stop the message right here with just these two stop signs, uh, you would want to ask the question, well, how do I yield and how do I stop, right? How do I do the trust thing and how do I then stop leaning on my own understanding? And to really oversimplify the thing, we would listen to the sermon last week. We would say, well, read the scriptures then. If we believe that the scriptures is a reflection of what God thinks, and it is, then we would invest our time in understanding the thing, right? We would invest our time in what it takes to understand that which God has said. As we hear God, then we know what to trust, what to yield to. As we hear from God, we know what to stop in our understanding. And frankly, God says a number of things that go against the grain. Things I don't necessarily like. Things that actually don't sound wise to me. So he says all kinds of things that go against the grain of humanity. He says things like, you should be faithful to your spouse. And that's not always what you want to do. He says things like, don't lie, even if it means you're going to miss the promotion at work. And he says things like, you, you be humble don't blow your own horn, even if you've got a reason to blow your own horn. Humility is better than arrogance. I don't like that sometimes. I prefer arrogance. He says things like obey your parents. That was not always easy 
when I was young, and it's not always easy now, taking care of my elderly mother-in-law. Not always easy. I sing, says things like stay sexually pure, keep your bodies covered. <laughs> so many of the things in the scriptures cut across the grain of that which I would prefer, and yet the scripture says, trust in the Lord, put your confidence somewhere else, lean not on your own understanding, it's inherently weak. You yield and you stop to get wisdom. Now the third phrase in that whole thing is, in all your ways acknowledge Him. Okay, in all your ways acknowledge Him. Or submit to Him, some of your scriptures might say. This is the sign I think that's merge. It's different than yield, right? It's different than yield. Yield means, you know what, somebody else has the priority. They take precedence, and so you, 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 you yield in. Then there's this merge thing, and merging isn't an easy thing in traffic. I did it some more this morning driving up from Burlington a few times as you get onto the highway, right? It's not particularly, in fact, more accidents happen then than in most other places on the road. It's in the merging process that lots of accidents happen. You know, you, it takes some skill and some work. You got to get up to speed, the right speed, not too fast, not too slow. You got to make sure there's a gap there that you can move over. And then you got to get in, and then you got to make sure you're not going over too far. There's a lot of negotiating, a lot of finesse that actually takes place to merge in successfully. And, and I think this is what exactly what this passage is saying, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Merge with God in your daily routine. God is going in a direction. Find it. Join it. Merge. Align yourself with God's plans. Align yourself with God's value. Trusting and learning have more to do with the head and the heart. This is more practical. This has to do with your hands, right? This has to do with doing something functional. It's more physical in the sense, more practical. God is already going in a direction for you. He is. He has some plans. He has some desires. He's going in a direction. The point is what we need to do is find that and merge in with God. And now there, there's a lot of skill that's going to be involved in understanding what God is doing in your life. Even in the things that you don't like, as I've just said. There's a lot of skill that's needed in there. You're going to have to be watching an awful lot for God at work in your life. What is God doing? What, is, what has he done today? What are some of the things that surround me that indicate that God is moving here? It's probably going to mean asking some friends. It's probably going to mean me, maybe even being in a small group, a consistent group that actually speaks into your life and says, oh, I see what God is doing, or here's what I sense out for you, or, and this is what God is doing here. Merge in with that. Figure that out. Get involved. I think it takes a lot of praying, too. Praying that God would show himself in obvious ways. But also pray that he would show you in subtle ways and that you'd be willing to see the subtlety of what God is doing day by day. It means making a bunch of mid-course corrections, too, because we make some decisions what we think God is doing, and then we realize, whoops, nope, not quite, <laughs> And we make some mid-course corrections and we're sensing what God is doing day by day in our life so that we can merge into what God is doing. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. I remember um, when we were, we, uh, our first house that we'd owned, a little townhouse, we started there with one child and, and ended up having three and so uh, the house was just getting too small, and I remember uh, Karen and I decided, you know, we really need to find something else. It's going to be hard, be tough, because uh, we liked the little place, but it, and it was comfortable. We could afford it. I'm not sure we could afford anything else, but 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 we decided it was time to change. So we just went after it, and we looked, and we found a house, and we put a conditional offer in it, and thought it was a good one, and they rejected it. And we lost it. So what do you do? 
Well, you could have a pity party if you want, but that's not the way I work. The way I work is, ha, do you think you can beat me? I'm going to find another place. So off we went. We found another place, put in a conditional offer. Guess what happened? Turned down. So now what do you do? Is it two strikes you're out? Like, how do you live life in this one, right? Well, I'm a little bit arrogant, okay? I'm not going to let them stop me. We went out, found another place, put another offer in. Guess what happened? Turned down. Well, maybe it is three strikes and you're out. <laughs> like, 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 right? Okay, God, I don't know what you're doing. But what I do know is that what I'm doing ain't working. That's what I know. And we just decided, you know what, Lord? You're either going to have us to stay here or you're going to make something happen and we're just going to let you do it. We'll see if we can't merge into what you're doing. Well, sure enough, isn't that when the house sold? Well, now I got nothing to, I got no house on condition. Where are we going to live now? Oh, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. We did say that we were going to merge into what God wanted. That's what we said. Then sure enough, he came through. He came through with a house that was bigger and better than the one, the three we'd put offers in. And we didn't have to move the kids from their school. We didn't have to change our phone number. We didn't have to change our lifestyle. God had something for us. But he needed us to merge. He needed us to merge in what he was doing. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He's going in a direction. Find that. I didn't put this on screen, but those who take notes, write down this verse. It's Isaiah 30, 20, and 21. Isaiah 30, 20, and 21. Listen to this. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teacher will be hidden no more. With your own eyes you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. This is our God. This is our prime teacher who says that life isn't always smooth. Adversity, affliction. But there behind you, you will hear this voice, this teacher saying, this is the way. Walk in this way. This is what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is telling us today. Yield. Give your confidence to something outside of yourself. Stop. Stop in your own understanding, using your own understanding. Merge. God is walking. He's ahead of you. Now walk this way. Now what can you expect if those are the three postures of life? If those are the three road signs of life, what are we going to expect? You already know, right? Right? Because we quoted the verse already. It gives the results, the conclusion. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Or he will direct your paths. Choose a version, they're all great. Straight paths. There isn't a particular road sign for this one, but I've chosen one anyways. It's not exact, but you get the point, don't you? I mean, this is a one-way sign. And I guess that works too, right? I guess as a road sign for this message, it works as well. Straight paths. See, God is paving a way. It's a straight path. Now, if, if you were to drive to Florida, say, you would maybe go out to Detroit and take I-75 and go, drive straight on down there, right? And you'd get there. You could go that way. Or you could say, yeah, we're going to get to Florida by way of California, right? Now, that's going to take more energy, more time, more money, more life. See, the straight path 
is always a more efficient path. Now that doesn't mean there's no potholes on that straight path, right? Don't, don't get us wrong here. A straight path doesn't mean a perfect one, right? It's a directed path, <laughs> right? It's a directed path. It's a God-directed path, not without its potholes, but it's a God-directed path. God never promises that the way to a wise life is without difficulties, but he does say it's a straight path. Unfortunately, our generation has been more concerned with speed than direction. Think about that for a second. Our generation is much more interested in speed than direction. You have to have it all and you have to have it now. And if you can't get it now, you can't afford it now, put it on credit. There's no such thing as a starter home anymore. We're all interested in speed, not direction. Your company was sold and, and now the new owners are saying, well, we have to let people go and there are fewer workers, but we also expect you to have more of a quota, get more done. You see, it's, it's a world, it's a work world that's more interested in speed than direction. Or maybe it's your investments. Right? They have to produce more and more and more, otherwise I can't retire. <laughs> right? Speed more than direction. Now, the God of the Scripture is far more interested in direction than speed. Have you ever noticed that? It explains why the scripture so oftentimes says, wait. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and wait on the Lord. Be still, be still, be still, and know that I am God. There's a God in heaven who is far more interested in direction in life than speed in life. A God who is there for straight paths. A man fell into a pit, a deep pit. Fell right down into that pit and, and, and some guy walked by up top, he was a subjective sort of a guy, and he said, wow, I feel for you in that pit. And then there was the objective kind of guy who came by and he says, wow, that's a deep pit. And then there's a vindictive kind of a person walked on by and said, um, you must somehow deserve that pit. Then a philosopher came by and said, wow, you must somehow want to be in that pit. And then a curious person came by and said, wow, that's a deep pit. The religious person came by and said, pray that you would get out of that pit. And then God walks by and he says, here, let me help you out of that pit. My friend, God has straight paths. As we yield, as we stop, as we merge. Now, friends, that is how you get wisdom. Father, we need you. We recognize that this world draws us away from wisdom more than to it. It draws us to wanting that which we want for ourselves and for ourselves only. It draws us to thinking that truth, that wisdom is only about me and the things that I believe and the things that are my opinion and my personal biases. Oh, Father, we release ourselves to a greater one the one who has wisdom. We choose to put our confidence outside of ourselves. We choose to stop relying on our own understanding. We choose to pay attention to that which you are doing in our lives so that we can join you in that which you're doing in our lives. And we look forward to the straight paths. Do this, Lord, for our good and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.